In this session, I'll be describing the kind of honesty that nonviolent communication supports. It's a radically different kind of honesty than many of us have been educated to use. Many of us have been educated by an honesty that evolves from our system of justice, retributive justice, which judges people as right or wrong, good or bad, with the attachment to that, that if you are good, right, appropriate, etc., you deserve to be rewarded. But if you are bad, wrong, etc., you deserve to suffer, be punished, etc. It's my belief that that kind of honesty, that kind of thinking, is the basis of violence on our planet. It's a way of thinking that makes violence enjoyable. We're interested in nonviolent communication with the kind of honesty that supports people connecting with each other in a way that makes compassionate giving inevitable, that makes it enjoyable for people to contribute to each other's well-being. This kind of honesty basically involves telling people what's alive in us without using any words that criticize and to tell people what would make life more wonderful for us, what we are requesting without presenting this as a demand, but to present it as a request. So let's look at what kind of honesty is involved in this evaluation of this kind. First of all, it's very important to be able to make clear observations to people that tell them what language on their part is stimulating our needs being fulfilled and what things they're doing that are not fulfilling our needs. This is one of the hardest things for human beings to do. It involves observing without evaluating, which Krishnamurti says is the highest form of human intelligence to observe without evaluating. So in nonviolent communication, we want to be sure that whenever we want to talk to somebody about something they're doing that we're not happy with, that we clearly put this in the form of an observation. Now, this doesn't mean that that's all we do. The observation by itself doesn't tell fully what's alive in us. We need to let the person know how we evaluate this behavior. But we need our evaluation to be of a form that lets people know how our needs are affected by the behavior and that doesn't use any words that can be heard as criticism, judgment of a moralistic variety, or diagnosis that implies some kind of abnormality. So our evaluation needs to be focused on the life within ourselves, which to me means it needs to contain reference to our needs. We need to let people know what needs of ours are being met or not being met by their behavior and how we feel as a result of it. So when we tell people clearly our feelings and needs, we're letting them know what's alive in us when they do what they are doing. This is an evaluation based on life, not an evaluation that criticizes or blames. But this is quite a challenging way to evaluate because it's not how many of us have been educated to think and communicate. For example, this form of evaluation requires a literacy of feeling, that we tell people how we feel when they behave in a certain way. The word feel by itself can often be used in a way that doesn't refer to feelings as I define feelings. As soon as you say, I feel that was wrong, I would call that a thought not a feeling. So many people use the word feeling and thought interchangeably. But in nonviolent communication, when we use the word feeling, we want it to refer to an emotion that a person is experiencing and that doesn't contain any diagnosis or intellectual analysis of the other person. So feelings would be feelings like, I feel frustration, I feel sadness, I feel irritation. When our needs are not getting met, but when our needs are getting met, I feel happy, I feel joyful, I feel pleasure. Feelings are a language of life. And the cultures that we have been living under for about 10,000 years, domination cultures in which some people claim to be superiors and have a right to control others, people do not make good slaves when they are connected to life. So feelings are not regarded as a positive thing to say. Feelings are associated with weakness, as being immature, as being too emotional. So not only aren't we 
educated to speak a language of life, a language of feelings. We have been given a cultural education that has very negative connotation to many of our emotions. So we learn very quickly in life to cover up our emotions and hide them, even though if we want to relate in a way that promotes compassion between ourselves and other people, feelings are a key ingredient. So in nonviolent communication, honesty consists of telling people what they're doing clearly in the form of a clear observation and then evaluating it with reference to feelings and needs. So I've just described what I mean by feelings. And then we connect these feelings to our needs because nonviolent communication is based on the awareness that feelings are manifestations of what is happening to our needs. When our needs are being fulfilled, we feel pleasureful feeling. When our needs are not being fulfilled, we feel painful feeling. This is Mother Nature's way of helping us to judge our environment in terms of whether what is happening is life-serving or not. So if we're eating foods that are not good for our health, we feel painful kinds of reactions to this eating. On the other hand, if we feel good, enriched, stronger, our feelings tell us that our needs for food have been well met by this. So, painful feelings tell us our needs are not getting met. Pleasureful feelings tell us our needs are met. Now, the most important part of honesty in nonviolent communication is our ability to clarify what is happening to our needs at a given moment. So, we tell what the other person has done, how we feel about it, but the central part of the evaluation, then, is to relate our feelings to our needs. And this requires a need consciousness and a need literacy, which is not easy to come about, because, once again, the structures in which we have been living for a long time require us to be educated in a way in which we are not connected to our needs. People don't make good slaves to authority when they are alive, and our needs are the life that's going on within us. So not only are we not educated to speak of our needs and to have a full vocabulary and literacy for talking about our needs, we are given a lot of cultural training that makes it shameful to have needs. We have been educated in a way that gets us cut off from life, cut off from our needs. And instead of a language of life for evaluating, we have been taught to evaluate with reference to rightness and wrongness, criticism of people. So in our training, we suggest to be sure that we learn how to be honest without any criticism, without any blame, without any judgment of a kind that people hear that what they're doing is bad or wrong. Now, when I say this, uh, many people get very confused and upset with it. Their whole lives have been based on the language of good, bad, right, wrong. They see it's all about how you are judged by authority, and if you're judged right, you get rewarded, and bad, you get punished. Their whole concept of religion is to think of a God that sits up and judges people good, bad, right, wrong, and when they are dead, and if they have been good enough, then they go to heaven, and if they have been bad, they go to hell. So our whole brain, our consciousness, is all shaped by this language of criticism, blame, and we're disconnected from our needs. I was not suggesting that we not judge or evaluate people's behavior. I was suggesting that we not judge them in a way that perpetuates retributive justice, justice based on the concepts of punishment and reward. But I think it's very important to be honest and to evaluate and judge with a language of life which tells people whether our needs are being met or not being met by what they're doing. But, of course, this is not easy for people to come by because, as I say, we have not only not been encouraged to develop a language of life, a language of needs, but have been systematically educated to suppress our needs because people don't make good slaves when they are connected to life. So much of nonviolent communication training is designed to helping people develop a consciousness and literacy of need and learning how to express these needs to others in a language that others can easily see what the need is 
without hearing any criticism. But since many people don't have this vocabulary, we have to do exercises to give them a lot of practice. It's like learning a new language. So we suggest that people write down those criticism, blaming words that they have used most in their lives of other people. And so they make a list of these words. So some people, selfish is one of the top words. You know, that's a selfish thing to do. Or others will say that's a stupid thing to do. Or you had no right to do that. So we get them to list those criticism and blaming statements they have probably made the most often in their lives of other people. Then when they have this list of the most frequent criticism and judgmental word they have used, we ask them to make an observation of what somebody might have done that was a stimulus for those words. And when they have that down, we then help them to see that all criticism, all blame, is a tragic expression of an unmet need, that we can be more truthful by saying what the need is than any words which blame or criticize. But this is not easy because people usually do not have a language of needs. But this exercise helps them, so we get them to go down for each item on their list of their most frequently used criticisms of others. That when they think of what might have stimulated that, and then to translate their criticism into an unmet need. We suggest that everyone have at least a vocabulary of nine human needs. In the United States, we measure the success on the measurements of the GNP, the gross national product, which essentially is how much money is made in certain areas. That system shows that it's successful when the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Manfred Max Neef's approach to economic success is based on whether human needs are met by all of the parties in the culture. So since his whole system of economy is based on human needs, he's gone to some trouble to research what are the basic human needs that need to be fulfilled if we're to have a safe, healthy, peaceful world. And he comes up with nine needs. And the success of an economic system, as he would measure it, is how well these needs are met by the, everyone in the population. I realized that I had several words that were different ways of saying basically the same need. And I realize he's probably right. that We probably do just have about nine needs that we need to get real good at being able to express to other people. So let me offer you what these nine needs are that Manfred Max Neef is talking about. And I'll use more my language than his, but here are the needs that he comes up with. First, sustenance. And by that, he means the basic physical needs such as food, air, water, shelter. Most people that I work with, they're pretty good at expressing those needs. I guess we do need to learn those pretty quickly or we wouldn't survive very long. The next need that Manfred Max Neef talks about is safety, protection. A third need, love. A fourth need, empathy. A fifth need, rest, recreation, play. Sixth need, community, a warm community. Seventh need, creativity. And the last two needs are particularly important needs in terms of safety on our planet, peace on our planet. The eighth need is autonomy. Look in the newspaper on any given day and see how many wars are going on over this need of autonomy. We human beings have a strong need to choose our own way in life and not to have it dictated by others who tell us what we have to do. And when they do that, it threatens this very basic need of ours for autonomy. And that need is alive in us from a very early age on. When we hear demands, it threatens this very basic need of ours to choose our own way in life. And the ninth need, Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist, describes as perhaps the most important need, important in the sense of our living our lives fully. He calls this a need for meaning, need for purpose. When I'm using this word, I often describe it this way. It's our need to contribute to life, to see how our efforts have made people's lives richer, life on the planet richer. So what I recommend to people is to get those nine needs into our own vocabulary. They may not be the words I just gave, words that you or the people that you're communicating might use. But if so, then for each of these nine, try to find words that describe that in a way that you resonate to, that really captures for you that. And then when you've developed a need vocabulary that works for you, 
then you may see that it may not work for the others with whom you are communicating with daily. For example, if you have a three-year-old in your house, the word autonomy may not work for the child, even though you may know what this word means. It resonates to your need for autonomy. But the three-year-old may not use the word autonomy, but they have the need for autonomy because all human beings have the same need. That's very important to be conscious of, that all human beings have the same need. So even though we may have different vocabularies for describing these needs, everybody has the same need. So to really connect in a way that promotes compassion between ourselves and others, we need to be able to express needs in a language that the other people can resonate to. So take this list of nine need words that you resonate to. The words describe the needs for you. But then, if you're living with a three-year-old, figure out how to say each of these needs in a way that the three-year-old can resonate to. If you're working with street gang members, learn how to say these needs in a language that they can resonate to. If you're working with college professors, translate it into their language. In other words, if we really want to connect with human beings in a way in which we enjoy each other and enjoy contributing to each other's well-being, we need to be very literate with the language of needs. And any time we find ourselves wanting to criticize, to translate that criticism into our needs that isn't being met, we are far more likely to get our needs met when we speak our needs than when we tell people what's wrong with them. So what I'm saying is that we evaluate behavior best according to the principles of nonviolent communication, where best means in a way that promotes compassionate giving, people enjoying learning from each other, that we are much more likely to promote connections of that sort, speaking clear observation, feelings, and needs, and to avoid words like right, wrong, good, bad, appropriate, inappropriate, etc., etc., especially words like should, shouldn't, have to, can't. Judgments and evaluations are very helpful if they're a language of life, but when we put it in the form of a language of right, wrong, good, bad, that's promoting a system of domination that I believe is contributing to violence on the planet. In nonviolent communication, we not only want to evaluate without any criticism or blame, we also want to evaluate without any praise or compliments. In nonviolent communication, the focus of our attention is on needs. We want people to see how their behavior affects human needs, whether it fulfills their own needs or doesn't whether it fulfills others' needs or not. It's when we are connected in this way to what everyone is needing that we have the greatest chance of finding ways of getting everybody's needs met. But when any criticism gets into the dialogue, any words that imply wrong, bad, stupid, etc., instead of ending in compassionate giving, we're far more likely to end in alienation, wars, etc. After we have made clear expressions of what's alive in us, namely what we're observing, what we're feeling, what we're needing. If our need is not getting met, then we need to end on a clear request, and this request needs to make explicit what response we're wanting from the person we're speaking with at this moment. In nonviolent communication, we tell people what we do want rather than what we don't want. You can add that what you don't want after you have said what you do want. So, we want to make clear requests after we have made our needs clear. We need to also know the difference between a wish and a clear request. A wish says generally what we would like to happen in the future. In nonviolent communication, when we've expressed a need that isn't met, we end on a clear request of what we want back at this moment. And the request needs to be in action language. We cannot use vague language like, I want you to help me. What does that mean? In different connections, it could mean quite different things. So we have to say not, I want you to help me with this problem. You have to say, I'd like you to tell me what you think would get my needs met in this situation. Tell me is much more specific. Help me. But it's not only important that we make very clear requests in clear action language. It's very important that we present the request as a request and not as a demand. Because if people hear demand, it takes much of the joy away from doing anything. And it is much more likely to provoke resistance than cooperation. Now, it's hard for people 
not to hear demands, especially if they have been in situations with authorities who think it's their job to make demands and who tell people you either do it or else. Or parents who say, please, maybe in a very nice way, but the child has experience from the past that if they don't do it, in some way or other, they will be blamed or punished. So therefore, we need to make our request in a way that people trust that it is a request and not a demand. With many people, this is very hard to get them to trust that our requests are requests and not demand. To whatever degree people carry memories that when they don't do what other people want, they have been criticized, guilted, blamed, punished, then it becomes very hard to trust that when somebody says what they would like, that it is a request and not a demand. So, in nonviolent communication, we say what is alive in us, what we're observing, feeling, needing. We say clear request and present it as best we can in a way that people can trust that it is a request and not a demand. Now, some messages are really hard to say in a nonviolent communication, and some of these messages are very important to be able to say. For example, the word no. How do you say no in a way that's in harmony with nonviolent communication. It requires saying three things. First, when somebody requests something of you, to say no in nonviolent communication, we begin by showing that we receive the other person's request as a gift. They're giving us a gift when they ask us to do something. It gives us a chance to contribute to their well-being. So, how do we do this? Well, largely, non-verbally, by how we respond to what they've asked us to do. Our non-verbal behavior will often tell people whether we're hearing demand, criticism, or as a request that gives us a chance to contribute to their well-being. So, receiving what they have said is a gift is the first step in how to say no. The second step is to be aware that no is a poor expression of a need. Any time a person says no, they're basically saying, I have a need that keeps me from wanting to do what you have requested at this moment. So to say no in a nonviolent communication way, we say the need that keeps us from saying yes. What need keeps you at that moment wanting to do what the other person has requested? The third ingredient in saying no in a nonviolent communication is to end on a request that searches for a way to get everybody's needs met. So the three parts of saying no in a nonviolent communication way is, first of all, to show a, an empathic reception of the request of the other person. They feel understood, that their need was understood, their request was understood. Second, we don't say no, we don't say I can't. We say the need that keeps us from saying yes. And we end with a request that searches for a way to get everybody's needs met. Another message that's hard to say in a nonviolent communication way. How do we let people know when they're using more words than we want to hear? How do we do that without criticizing? Of course, we all know how to interrupt another person when they're using more words when we want to hear. In a violent way, we wait for them to breathe, and then we say quickly, uh, 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 excuse me, I just remembered my house is on fire, and we get out of the conversation as quickly as we can. Or we change the topic, do anything, so we don't have to listen to more words. In nonviolent communication, we stop the other person when we've heard more words than we want to hear, and let them know what our needs are. Excuse me, but... I'm impatient right now because I have a need for, and then we tell them what needs are not being met by the amount of words the other person is used. And again, we end on a clear request that searches for a way to get our need met and the other person's. One reason I've found that people use more words than anybody wants to hear is that the speaker is not conscious of what they want back. They don't understand what their own present requests are, and so they keep going on and on trying to get what they want when they're not even too sure what they want in the conversation. If you speak to people and you're not clear what you want back from them, it takes the energy from the conversation. It makes it confusing to know how to follow. It makes it less interesting. So this is a very important part of nonviolent communication, that when we reveal our honesty, what's alive in us, we say what's going on, to be conscious of what we want back. And my prediction is the more conscious you are of what you want back in the form of what you're requesting of your listener, 
you'll use fewer words and get more understanding. Now, some needs are not too easy for people to get clear what they do want back to get these needs met. And very often, these are very important needs to get met. So, very important needs like respect. It's very important to know clearly what we do want from people. And without being clear about that, we often play some very oppressive game. For example, let's take another very important need to make this point clear. How, by not having clear requests, we often get involved in very oppressive forms of interpersonal relationships. Let's look at this word love. This is a very important need, and it's not always an easy need for us to get clear what our requests are of the other person. And it's important to get our requests clear when we have a need for love that isn't getting met, because research shows that different people have quite different requests to get their need for love met. What'll meet one person's need for love doesn't necessarily meet another's need for love. Many of us carry around very destructive strategies for getting our basic needs met. Strategies that are destructive, first of all, because they're not possible, or secondly, because they deny the needs of the other person, require that the other person be subservient to us. So it's very important to be able to say exactly what we want to meet our need for love. Very important. What do we want to meet our need for understanding and to express these requests in clear action language. Now, love, many people use in a different way than as a need. Some people use the word love as a feeling. In nonviolent communication, we suggest that we use the word love solely as a need and not as a feeling. We're trying to express emotion, but then use other words beside love for describing what we are feeling. I feel warm, tender, cuddly emotions. Nonviolent communication gets you to see how important it is to use the word love as a need. And then, since it's such an important need, to be very explicit what we want from people to meet this need. Another thing that's very important in expressing our needs in a nonviolent communication way is not to get our need confused with strategies for getting the needs met. Here's two characteristics that will help us to differentiate between needs and requests or strategies for getting our needs met. First of all, needs are universal. All human beings have the same need. The second thing that differentiates a need from a strategy is a need contains no reference to specific people taking specific action. So anytime we say, I want you to, that's not a need. That's a request or a strategy. Another thing that's very important when we do express clear requests is to make sure that we're not addicted to getting what we want. I like the way the Buddha says this. The Buddha says, never get addicted to your requests. If your intent is to get people to do what you want, that's a different intent than we need to have if we're using nonviolent communication. In nonviolent communication, it's never our objective to get what we want. It's to create the quality of connection with people that ends with everybody getting their needs met. Everyone's needs getting met is the objective of nonviolent communication. This doesn't require ever giving up or giving in. It just means not getting addicted to our strategy. If we are addicted to our strategy, it's very easy for the other person to hear our request as a demand, and this threatens their need for autonomy and makes it harder for them to enjoy giving. So we need to say clearly what we want, but the objective is to create a connection in which everybody's needs get met through compassionate giving. But if your objective is just to get people to do what you want, don't study nonviolent communication. Go to a dog obedience school and see how they train dogs.